So guys, this is an update on my video asking if Gilgo Beach serial killer suspect Rex Hureman is the Route 29 stalker in Virginia. We will discuss a major update in which a witness came forward in January of 2024 and how that witness may tie Rex Hureman to murders in Virginia. Now, I discovered several pieces of information that affect this case, including addressing the glaring piece of evidence that many web sleuths are ignoring, which is that almost all witnesses claim the man they say is the Route 29 stalker, was 5 foot 10 to 6 feet tall, much shorter than Rex Hureman, who's at least 6 foot 4. You'll also get critical information on what famous serial killer may be connected to at least two of the Route 29 stalker murders. Also, you'll learn about the man who was charged in those two murders and the crime he pled guilty to and what that means. We'll also watch a video Virginia police showed to the public of a man possibly stalking a Route 29 stalker victim right before she was murdered. And some people say the man in that video looks like Rex Hureman. By the end of this video, you'll see my reporting has evolved from asking is Rex Hureman the Route 29 stalker into something even more complex. So let's start off with the story of the Route 29 stalker murders and the victims in this case. This was a series of murders that occurred in Virginia starting in 1996. Now why do I suspect Rex Sherman? I'm not picking his name out of a hat. His mother, who he reportedly had an oddly close relationship with, uh, sold him their Massapequa Park house in 1995 and she moved to Virginia. Rex Hureman, who we can naturally assume would visit her often, but he actually talked about it in a 2018 civil deposition but the most compelling reason is he looks very similar to the composite sketches. Multiple sketches by multiple witnesses, and to me they look very similar to him. The Route 29 stalker, his first known victim, is her name is Alicia Showalter Reynolds. A little bit of the case details on March 2nd, 1996. Alicia Showalter Reynolds of Baltimore, Maryland said goodbye to her husband and left her home. It was Saturday about 7.30 a.m. Alicia planned to drive more than 150 miles to spend the day shopping with her mother in Charlottesville, Virginia. She left early, giving herself plenty of time to be at the mall by 10.30 a.m. Alicia's mother arrived on time, expecting her daughter at any moment. But when Alicia was late, Sadie Showalter became worried. Quote, Right about 11 a.m. she wasn't there, and I said, this is not like Alicia. I wonder what's going on. But I made myself wait until 11.15, and then I finally called her husband, Mark, end quote. A quote from Mark Reynolds. At that point, I said, you know, the weather is kind of bad this morning. You know, there was a little fog. There was a little drizzle. It could have been some slick roads. Maybe she just slowed down a little bit. So give her a little while and give me a call back, end quote. Sadie continued to wait. An hour passed, then two, but Alicia never showed up. At 6 p.m. that evening, a Virginia State Trooper found Alicia's car abandoned along a highway near Culpeper, Virginia. That highway is Route 29. This was 50 miles from the shopping mall, and interestingly, a white paper napkin had been tucked under the windshield wiper, a commonly used signal of car trouble. When the car was examined, however, there was no mechanical problems. And this, of course, is going to get into the key to these murders is the ruse that the Route 29 stalker used on these women to lure them into thinking they had car problems or he was having car problems and then to eventually murder them. And there's evidence that he practiced for weeks before Alicia's murder, not specifically to kill her, but just luring women, stalking them, almost killing them. The next day, after Alicia went missing, the local news broadcasting uh, reports of Alicia's disappearance. Police set up a roadblock where Alicia's car was found, hoping to track down people who may have seen something. At least three people claim they saw Alicia talking to a clean-cut white man with a dark-colored pickup truck 
close to 20 women called to say they had recently been approached on the highway by a man fitting that exact description. Police began to realize that whatever had happened to Alicia might have been a plot that had been evolving for weeks. According to Special Agent Thomas Carter with the FBI uh, in Fredericksburg, Virginia, quote, most of the witnesses talked about a man who would give up, uh, who would come up behind them or beside them in a dark, small pickup truck, flashing his headlights, honking his horn, looking to get uh, their attention in any way he could. Most of the women that did have some concern for their vehicle did manage to pull off to the side of the road. He immediately jumps underneath their vehicle, conducts an examination, comes out, and then engages them in a very polite conversation about the mechanical difficulties that he has allegedly uncovered, end quote. At that point, the helpful stranger usually offered to dr drive the woman to the nearest payphone. At least two women accepted his offer and nothing happened to them. Other women found the stranger to be anything but courteous. Agent Carter, quote, some of the women would not pull over for him, but merely went to the next exit or to their destination and had someone else look at their vehicle. The only instances where we have found that individual became agitated were those instances where women either refused his assistance or refused to pull over for him. And in those instances, there was a display of anger by him, such as pounding his fist on the steering wheel or murmuring things under his breath. Rick Jenkins with the Virginia State Police believes the stranger was performing dry runs. Quote, looking at all the stops he made, I think we pretty much all agree that he was getting his courage up, if you will. He was practicing, getting comfortable at what he was doing with stopping these ladies until he found someone that trusted him enough for him to carry forth what he intended to do. One week before Alicia disappeared, a woman driving in a neighboring county apparently fell for the same trick. Master Detective Leo J. McDonnell with the Prince William County Police spoke to her. Quote, she said from the first moment she met him, he was soft-spoken. He seemed to be trustworthy. She had no problem with it at all. And she knew that she needed a ride home. She didn't know how to get home. So she accepted the ride. As they were going along the road, he would slow down and make the excuse that he couldn't see because of the vehicles behind him. And he pulled off the road. He did this three times. We believe that he was trying to establish a place to do something. She became very frightened. She fought with him. And he decided he didn't want to fight with her. So he pushed her out of the car, end quote. The woman broke her ankle, but she got away. Just seven days later, Alicia Reynolds was not so lucky. On May 7, 1996, two months after she disappeared, her body was found in a wooded area 15 miles southeast of Culpeper. She had been murdered. Perhaps on the same day she disappeared, but perhaps not. Rick Jenkins with the Virginia State Police suspects Alicia's killer may be doing the same exact thing somewhere else. Quote, it is possible that the individual has fled this area, possibly the state, and may be in another community now where he may be preparing to start the same type of behavior, end quote. I'm really, really glad the media picked up on this story. You know, I got a lot of my information on this story from murderingcorp.wordpress.com. This to me is the strongest argument and I saw no one in the media was covering this. I was shocked because when I, as soon as I saw the Route 29 stalker composite sketch, I mean my jaw hit the ground. I'm like, oh my God, that's human. Um, doesn't prove it's him, but man, does it look so much like him. And this fits perfectly. His mother just moved there. She literally moved there just a few months before Alicia Reynolds was killed. And again, we know this killer, or we suspect this killer, did dry runs for weeks, maybe even months, prior to killing Alicia. So it just fits with the timeline. It fits with the individual. And look at those faces. So the next two victims after Alicia Reynolds who were killed, uh, again, Alicia Reynolds was killed March of 96 um, by the Route 29 stalker. And many people believe that on June 1st, 1996, just a couple months later, Lolly Winans and Julie Williams were also murdered at their campsite in Shenandoah National Park, which is basically in Culpeper, Virginia, which is where Alicia Reynolds' car was found. So just a couple months later, 
these two you know, innocent young girls who are just camping together get brutally murdered. I think both their throats were slashed, they were bound with duct tape. Just brutal, brutal murders of these two innocent victims right around the same area as Alicia Showalter just a couple months later. Their killer uh, has never been found. Julie, 24, of St. Cloud, Minnesota, and Lolly, 26, of Unity, Maine, pitched their tent off of one of Shenandoah National Park's horse trails. They chose a peaceful spot next to a mountain stream, which investigators later noted may have uh, drowned out of sound of approaching footsteps, so the running water may have made them very ideal victims for a, a predator, a killer, who wanted to basically sneak up on them. I don't know the horrors they went through, but I feel so bad for them and their families. So on May 31st, 1996, Thomas Williams, Julie's father, reported his daughter missing. Park rangers started a search and located Julie and Lolly's car just north of Skyland Lodge. We started doing hasty searches to cover all of those trail corridors in the general area to see if we could locate them. Quote, at some point during these hasty searches, we did locate the dog. Unquote. Taj, the golden retriever, was wandering through the park unleashed. The next evening, evening on June 1st, 1996, rangers found the bodies of Julie and Lolly at their campsite on Bridal Trail. Another sad detail about this story is that these two young ladies were just trying to comply with a law that was active at that time. It's, they've since ended it. But there used to be a law in Virginia that said backpackers, campers cannot set up their campsites close to access roads, close to basically the restaurants and stores and where everybody is. So they were sort of forced and they complied with the law um, to go set up their campsite, you know, basically in a more isolated and vulnerable place and that played right into this sadistic killer and what he did to them. The Winans and Williams families are still heartbroken and desperate for answers. I saw, um, I've seen several of these parents of these victims doing recent interviews. Very recently I was also very encouraged to see that Alicia Showalter Reynolds, I believe a relative of hers did an interview basically saying that, um, you know, because again, I sort of broke the news on Twitter from murderincorp.wordpress.com online. And once I broke it on Twitter, uh, other media picked it up immediately. And one of those media was U.S. Sun that went directly to this woman, the relative of Alicia. This woman also, I'm very thankful that they showed this to her. And she saw the same thing that I saw, which is that it looks just like him. Um, so it's at least worth a look by law enforcement, hopefully. But again, as we sit here today, the killer or killers of these young women uh, have not been brought to justice. So the next in the series of Route 29 stalker murders is Thelma Scroggins. This is just a few months after Alicia Reynolds and very shortly after Lolly Winans and Julie Williams, the two campers. Thelma was a 74-year-old woman. She was a church organist. Uh, she was a former mail carrier. And from the reports I saw, she was a beloved woman uh, by her family, by her neighborhood. You know, one of those women in the neighborhood who everybody knows, everybody loves, sort of everyone looks at her as sort of their grandmother. So the things that stand out to me about the Thelma Scroggins murder, number one, is just her location, Lignum. Um, knowing that Alicia Reynolds was brutally murdered there in this small town um, just a couple months earlier, that immediately to me connects those two murders or makes them very, very likely um, that there is the same perpetrator. Number two, she was shot four times in the head, and I know lots of people own guns, but it's just yet one more thing that fits with Rex Hureman. We know he was a well-renowned marksman in high school. We know he has a love of guns. They took 300 out of, him, out of his basement in 2023. But we also know he's hunting 
by this age. This is 1996. He's been out of college for like 10, 11 years. This is prime killing time, in my opinion, for Rex Sherman. And at the very least, we know this is prime hunting time. So he is killing animals in New York and probably other places that he goes. The Route 29 stalker used ruses to lure these women, to get them to drop their guard. Now with a 74-year-old woman, maybe you don't need a huge ruse, but I believe he still used one with her. Um, I think if he had tried to bust into her house or, you know, maybe even if he pointed a gun at her, you know, through, through a window or through a locked door or something, she would scream, she might call police. So I think he probably used a ruse with her, and I think it what we've heard of the Route 29 stalker is that he would probably knock on her door and say, you know, very politely, probably well-dressed with his little glasses, making him look so non-threatening, even though he's a big guy. You know, he can be very polite and affable when he wants to be. Go back and watch his 2021 interview he did with the French interviewer. Um, and he's very good at that. Aw, shucks, just humble guy next door, very well-groomed and his hair combed and everything. And he he probably said, ma'am, uh, I'm so sorry, my car broke down, do you mind if I use your phone? This is a sweet, innocent woman, probably, you know, naive, thinks, you know, oh, he's just a nice guy from the neighborhood, everybody loves her there, and then he did what he did to her. So those things stand out as well. But there's another thing that stands out, again, as far as these ruses, and I will actually find out about that more in a case we're about to talk about in a couple of minutes. But there is one more, other than the killer not being brought to justice in the Thelma Stra uh, Scroggins murder, there is actually one more very sad aspect to this story, and that is that three teenagers were charged with Thelma's murder. They were convicted of Thelma's murder, and all three teens went to jail for many years. And as it turns out, all three teens were innocent. Um, so to give you some background on that, Eric Weekly was convicted of second-degree murder in 2001 for the shooting death of Thelma Scroggins. And he was charged alongside Michael Hash and Jason Cloby, together known as the Culpepper Three. Weekly, who was 15 when the crime took place in Culpepper, Virginia, 1996, falsely confessed to the murder, implicating Hash and Cloby, who were 16 and 19 at the time of the crime. Weekly spent almost six years behind bars before being released in 2006. The conviction, however, remained on his record, making it very hard to find a job, among other things. While Cloby was tried and acquitted, Hash was convicted and sentenced to life with the testimony of a jailhouse informant. Ash had been transported from the Culpeper Jail to the Albemarle Charlottesville Regional Jail for just one night before the trial, when he just happened to be placed in a cell with Paul Carter, who would then claim that Michael Hash had confessed to him. So with the help of the Mid-Atlantic Innocence Project, uh, Hunton and Williams Law Firm, and UVA's Innocence Project, all three men were granted an absolute pardon, meaning that the court recognized they weren't being pardoned due to their good behavior or anything like that. They were being pardoned because they were innocent. So that's great for them. They got a large settlement recently. I think it was something like $90 million. Uh, but the fact remains that the killer or killers of Thelma Scroggins are still at large. So many people believe the next victim of the Route 29 stalker in Virginia was Ann Caroline McDaniel. It was a disappearance on September 18, 1996, and Ann was 20 years old. She disappeared from a group home for disabilities in Orange, Virginia. September 18, 1996, Ann Caroline McDaniels disappears from a group home for people with disabilities in Orange, Virginia. Uh, McDaniel had apparently told fellow residents she was going on a date, and uh, you know we don't know if that happened, we don't know who she ended up going off with, but what we do know is that uh, her body, her burned body, was found by hunters in a rural area of Batna, Virginia. Where is that? It's right next to Lignum, Virginia. This is why a lot of people associate her murder with the Route 29 stalker. Here we now have the third murder associated with this tiny little town 
in just five months. McDaniel's body was found covered by brush that was lit on fire about 70 feet from the road and 50 yards from a hunting cabin in the woods. That also jumps out at me. Again, just lots more details that to me are consistent with Herman. We know Herman was a hunter. Uh, we know Herman was visiting Virginia often, at least later we knew that. I think it's logical to assume he was visiting Virginia often at the, around this time. Again, this area is on the logical driving route from Herman's house in Massapequa Park to his mom's house in Palmyra, Virginia. And just such an eerie detail that uh, Ann's body was found just 50 yards from a hunting cabin in the woods. Another thing we know about Herman, I do anyways, I feel, uh, through evidence, that he liked to torture his victims. He, if he had the opportunity, loved to uh, torment them, torture them, tie them up, beat them, rape them, keep them for hours, days, maybe weeks. I don't think in this case it would have been weeks, but uh, that hunter's cabin really stuck out to me, and who knows how long Ann uh, was alive and suffered between her disappearance and her murder. Another murder I want to talk about is Ann Carver Clapp. She was killed in September 15th, 1997, so a year basically after the Route 29 killings, she disappeared from the Charlottesville area. Although she disappeared from Charlottesville, where did she live? She lived in Palmyra, Virginia, only one mile from Rex Herman's mother's house. A man named Timothy Jones was charged with her murder, but he was acquitted. So here we have yet another victim with their, their killer still at large. Uh, Samantha Ann Clark was 19 years old. She was last seen in Orange, Virginia. That's the same town that Ann McDaniel uh, disappeared from. And she basically lived right across the field from where Ann Caroline McDaniel's house was. So not only did they both disappear from Orange, Virginia, Ann McDaniel disappeared in 1996. Again, that's right around the time of the Route 29 Stalker series, which, you know, many people feel just sort of mysteriously ended. And I think, sadly, they didn't end at all. The killer just was killing other places. He changed up his methods. And people just assume it's different, a different killer. You know, oh no, that's not the Route 29 Stalker because he didn't pull women over and say you have car trouble. Well, he can just change up his methods. Um, he's smart enough to do that. He's smart enough to come up with these ruses. He's smart enough to watch news stories where they're talking about the Route 29 stalker over and over again. And he just changes up his methods, goes and kills different people in different areas, not on Route 29, but still in Virginia. Uh, I mean, do you think a person like that who's capable of that savagery, that predatory behavior, it's just going to give it up. Oh, it was just a hobby I was doing for a few years. Yeah, right. So anyways, Samantha Ann Clark to this day um, has never been uh, found. And fortunately, police did in January of 2021 finally reclass her disappearance as a murder. Um, so she is now considered to be a murder victim. One thing that's kind of sad is I contacted the Orange, Virginia Police Department to tell them uh, about Ann Caroline McDaniel and Samantha Ann Clark and how they should take a look at Rex Sherman as being the killer given that he looks just like the sketch for the, the Route 29 stalker. And unfortunately, the police employee, who is a high-ranking police employee who I spoke to, told me, well, we have no unsigned homicides in Orange, Virginia, so leave us alone, basically. What this person I apparently didn't know is that her own police department, January 15th, 2021, the town of Orange Police Department, reclassified Samantha Ann Clark's disappearance as a murder. Quote, due to new information, and advances in investigative and forensic technology, Samantha's missing person investigation has been reclassified as an active abduction and murder investigation. It's December 18th, 2005. Cheryl Warner was murdered in her home in Culpeper, Virginia. Now, there's a couple reasons why this one sticks out to me. A, Culpeper, Virginia, as we know, that is where a lot of the activity of the Route 29 stalker took place. But here's another thing that really, really stuck out to me. She was on the phone with a relative of hers who heard this conversation. The relative told police they heard a man knock at her door and said he was having car trouble. And that just 
stood out to me like, again, my jaw hit the ground. That is the exact same ruse that the Route 29 stalker used on the women he killed, at least on some of them, we believe, based on living witnesses who he didn't kill, who said, yeah, he tried that routine with me. Cheryl Warner was later found in the basement, shot in the head, hanging by, uh, from the ceiling by an electrical cord. Her home was also set on fire. Cheryl Warner's house is on Route 29, and it's across the street from where Alicia Showalter's car was found in 1996. So, is Rex Hurman the man in this video? Seen talking to a Route 29 stalker victim right before she was murdered? Virginia police released this video and asked for the public's help in IDing this man. Patrick, who watched a few of my videos and commented on one of them, he recently gave me a great tip. He asked me if I'd seen the surveillance video released by police asking for the public's help in identifying the man seen in this video who police say was the last man to see Route 29 victim Cheryl Warner alive. Now this video is taken from a department store where Cheryl was shopping right before Christmas on December 18th, 2005. Only two hours before she was brutally murdered. Now Patrick and other web sleuths like Jay is for Justice think it looks like Rex Hurman. While on the phone with her dad, someone knocked at her front door and she said, Dad, I'm going to have to call you back. There's a man here who's having car trouble and he needs to use the phone. Cheryl was never heard from again. So her dad became understandably worried when she wouldn't answer her phone after a few minutes, so he called police. When police arrived at Cheryl's home, her house was on fire. When the fire department put out the fire, police then went into Cheryl's house, searched for her, and eventually found her in her basement. Cheryl was hanging from her basement ceiling, hung by an electrical cord around her neck, and she had been shot in the back of the head. Cheryl's murder was eerily similar to the murder of Thelma Scroggins. The video I'm about to play is from the night she was murdered, about one hour prior, where she's seen shopping for Christmas gifts for her three children at a local department store called Belks. Again, this video is from December 18th, 2005, and police released this video in 2014 saying they eagerly want the public's help in identifying the man seen talking to Cheryl in this video. So let's watch it and we'll discuss. It's hard to forget the murders of the Harvey and Baskerville families around New Year's Day nearly nine years ago. Ricky Gray was one of the men convicted and accused of murders before that. Tonight we've learned police are re-examining one of those cases. Our Greg McQuaid is here to tell us why. Well, this is video. That's why. Culpepper deputies released it just this morning. They say it's of murder victim Cheryl Warner shopping at the Belk store before her death. You see her talking to an unknown man at the door before leaving the store, and investigators think he was the last person to see her alive. The 37-year-old was found shot and hanging in her Culpepper basement that same day, December 18, 2005. The home was also set on fire. Ricky Gray was once indicted in her death, but years later, prosecutors set aside the charge based on DNA evidence at the scene that they say did not belong to Gray. According to Warner's father, she called him when she got home from shopping and they were talking about football when a man knocked on her door saying he was having car trouble and needed her telephone. Her father said the man was not alone and Cheryl Warner was never heard alive again. Again, this is video nearly nine years old at Christmas time from the Belk store in Culpeper. If you remember anything about that day or about this scene, 
or you recognize anyone in it, contact police immediately. I'm Greg McQuaid, CBS 6 News. So what do you guys think? Is that Rex Hurman in the video? Just one week after police released this video in 2014, they ID'd the suspect in the video. Police charged a man with Cheryl Warner's murder. I didn't know that before. So the man charged in Cheryl Warner's murder at one time, his name was Ricky Gray. Now, Ricky Gray confessed to killing a family of four in 2006. Ricky Gray and his nephew, Ray Dandridge, went on a killing spree in January of 2006. So this was just uh, one month after the murder of Cheryl Warner. And Gray and his nephew murdered seven people in six days and uh, he claimed he smoked marijuana laced with something yeah that's what makes you go kill seven people in six days no when you are a evil cowardly vicious killer you go kill seven people in six days so gray was convicted of killing Catherine and brian harvey and their two young daughters, Stella and Ruby, during a home invasion on New Year's Day. So that would have been literally 13 days after Cheryl Warner's murder. The Harveys were found brutally beaten, bound, and repeatedly stabbed in the basement of their Richmond, Virginia home, and the home was also set on fire. Five days later, Gray was also involved, though not convicted, in the murders of three other Richmond residents, Percy L. Tucker, his wife, Mary Tucker, and Mary's daughter, Ashley Baskerville. A Virginia jury convicted Gray of five counts of capital murder and sentenced him to death on two of the counts, the murders of Stella and Ruby, according to court documents. Dandridge was convicted of the killings of the Baskerville Tucker family and sentenced to life in prison. After Gray's arrest for the Harvey family murders, he also confessed to killing his own wife. With the help of Dandridge, he bludgeoned her to death with a lead pipe in November 2005, so just before Cheryl Warner's murder. Here we are, still 23 years after Cheryl Warner's murder, and there have been no arrests in her case, other than for Ricky Gray, uh, who was already in jail when they indicted him for her murder. But in 2008, a judge set aside that indictment due to his DNA didn't match DNA at the crime scene. One very important piece of information I have not mentioned in this video about Cheryl Warner's murder until now is that Cheryl Warner actually lived on Route 29. Literally. It, she lives on the actual route. And Cheryl Warner's house is directly across the street from where Alicia Showalter Reynolds' car was found abandoned. You can literally see, it's 50 yards away. You can see it from Cheryl Warner's house. And so that where her car was abandoned is where she was abducted. So another murder I think to take a look at, again, this is a thinking a little bit outside the box, um, but on April 8th, 2011, a man named Robert Hurahan disappeared from Palmyra, Virginia. Now that's the actual town. Uh, Rex Hurman's mom lived in. Robert Hurahan, 30, 33 
years old, vanished, uh, leaving a young daughter and wife of 13 years who believes he was murdered. Horahan has a heart condition that requires daily medication. He left his medication and never refilled his prescription. His car was found abandoned at a Target parking lot in La Plata, Maryland, over 100 miles away. Robert Hurahan didn't know anyone who lived in Maryland. He has never been seen again. So some details about the Robert Hurahan case, Hurahan case, sorry. So he was last seen in Palmyra, Virginia, which of course is the same small town Rex Hurahan's mom lived in from 1995 to 2018. So Hurahan was last seen in Palmyra, Virginia on April 8, 2011. On the day of his disappearance, he put on his work uniform and left at 6.30 a.m. as if to go work at his electrician job in Richmond, Virginia. Except he wasn't scheduled to work that day, something his wife was unaware of. He was driving his wife's car, a white 2004 Chevrolet Cavalier, with a Winnie the Pooh sticker in the back window and a vanity license plate reading Tara May. T-A-R-A-M-A-E. Hurahan drove northwest on Route 53. He had breakfast at the E.W. Thomas grocery store in Palmyra around 8 a.m. He had previously worked at the business and was well known there as a result. He was planning to meet a male friend, but he never arrived for the meeting. When he had breakfast was the last time anyone saw him. He was never seen or heard from again. Who is the male friend that... <laughs> Hurahan lies to his wife, saying, oh, honey, I'm going off to work, so that instead he can go eat breakfast at a well-known grocery store, a grocery store he was well-known at, and he's waiting for a male friend. That already sounds really suspicious, just of, like, what's going on there, you know? Um, did he have some kind of bisexual lifestyle, and he needs to hide it from the wife? I don't know, but for some reason, he needed to hide this meeting with this friend and pretend, oh, I'm going off to work, which means, honey, you're not gonna expect me home for at least eight hours, I'm assuming, possibly even longer than that. So he's going to meet uh, this quote unquote male friend and I'm assuming spend the day with the male friend? Uh, who was that male friend? Why didn't they show up? And did they maybe say, hey, Robert, you know, sorry, I can't come to the breakfast, but hey, just come down to my hotel. I'm down the street, blah, blah, blah. Maybe that male friend didn't want to be seen as the last person with this guy uh, in public, on camera, in a grocery store where everybody knows this guy. He's Mr. Popular there. Maybe the male friend said, nah, you know what? I don't think I want to be seen with you and have witnesses see me with you. So yeah, just let's come meet at this other place. I know we were going to meet for breakfast, but could that person have been Rex Sherman? I don't know, but I do find those details interesting. On May 28th, 50 days after his disappearance, Hurahan's car was found parked on the edge of the parking lot of a target in La Plata, Maryland, 115 miles away from his home. Some of Hurahan's belongings, including his brown work shirt and his valuable electrician's tools, were still inside and there was no evidence of a crime. Authorities tried to find security footage of when the car was parked in the lot, but by the time they've learned where the car was, the footage had been recorded over and they had a six-year-old daughter together. His wife believes he was murdered, as she doesn't think he would abandon their daughter. Uh, she doesn't believe he was being unfaithful or was involved with drugs and describes their relationship as a close and loving one. She stated they don't know anyone in Maryland and she doesn't know why Hurahan might have traveled there. So in that case, hopefully police are looking into who is this mysterious male friend that Mr. Hurahan was going to, that lied to his wife about, put on his uniform, instead of going to work, went to go meet this male friend for breakfast at this uh, supermarket where he was very well known, Mr. Hurahan. And who is that male friend who then did not show up? Is Rex Hurman only one of the Route 29 stalkers? Is there more than one Route 29 stalker? Evidence I learned seems to suggest the answer is yes. And although I still absolutely believe Rex Hurman killed in Virginia during the decades he admits to driving back and forth to visit his mother 
in Palmyra, Virginia, and I still believe he killed along Route 29. But I no longer think we're even looking for a one and only Route 29 serial killer. For example, I believe that at least two of the three prime suspects for decades in this case killed along Route 29. So I now think a better question for police, the media, web sleuths, and myself to ask, is Rex Hurman one of the Route 29 stalkers? But I think the best way to start is with the three primary suspects in this case for decades, and that'll lead to a couple of very important pieces of information that I learned. So let's start with Randy Taylor. On August 3rd, 2013, 17-year-old Alexis Murphy tweeted that she was on her way to the Berg, referring to a shopping trip she was planning on taking to Lynchburg, Virginia. She was last seen on surveillance video getting gas at Liberty Gas Station in Lovingston, Virginia. And she was last seen on that video talking to a heavily tattooed man driving a camouflage SUV. And she was then seen heading south on Route 29 behind the camouflage SUV. And she was never seen alive again. Her cell phone last pinged on Cannery Loop Road, where it then went dead. On August 6th, her car was found in Carmacky Cinema parking lot in Albemarle County, Virginia. Surveillance video showed someone had dropped it off a few nights earlier, but you couldn't tell who it was. So while canvassing the area of Alexis's last cell phone ping near Cannery Loop, they encountered a man named Randy Taylor, who was heavily tattooed and drove a camouflage SUV, and he closely resembled the man seen talking to Murphy at the gas station. He said he had never seen Alexis, never talked to her, didn't recognize her, which police knew was a lie. On August 7, 2013, police and FBI executed a search warrant on Taylor's home and found a torn fingernail embedded in the carpet, a stud earring, and female hair. 36 hours later, FBI analysis confirmed the hair, earring, and fingernail was Murphy's. When police then went back to Taylor's house, they found the shirt he was wearing in the surveillance video, balled up under his bed with a larger chunk of hair in it and an eyelash. They soon found Murphy's cell phone in the woods about 80 feet behind Taylor's house. In 2014, Taylor was charged with her abduction and murder, a very unusual step considering they hadn't found her body. At that time in Virginia's history, only one person had ever been convicted of murder without having a body present. Well, Taylor became the second, as the jury convicted him of her abduction and her murder. So Taylor was sentenced to two life sentences, and six years later, in 2020, they finally found Alexis Murphy's body next to a mountain on Stage Bridge Road right off of Route 29, this was seven and a half years after her murder, and they were able to find her body because Randy Taylor had told them where her body was located. Now, Taylor was also a prime suspect in the disappearance and murder of Samantha Clark three years before he murdered Alexis Murphy in 2010. So Taylor met Samantha Clark at a bar. He called her repeatedly. And I think he, they had six or seven phone calls from him. And he admitted that she had hung up on him. Uh, but he also said, oh, but, but she wanted me to call back. That's why I kept calling back. Um, now, Taylor never uh, confessed to her murder. And he was never charged. And again, three years after that, 
he murdered Alexis Murphy. So you can see why so many people thought he was the Route 29 stalker. And again, up until today, most police, media, and web sleuths think it's just one Route 29 stalker. Although they can't agree on just how many cases should be involved in the Route 29 series, but police have had access to his DNA for 10 years and he hasn't been charged in any of the Route 29 murder series. My heart goes out to Alexis Murphy, Samantha Clark, and their families. And I'm very happy that Alexis's family got the justice and answers they deserve. And we all know that there is no closure. Nothing will end the heartbreak that they have over their lost dear loved one and I hope Samantha Clark's family gets the justice and answers that they deserve and that she deserves as they are dearly missing her and living in pain to this day. So the second prime suspect for decades in the Route 29 stalker murders is Richard Ivonitz. Ivonitz was uh, known as a Navy veteran and a blue-collar regular guy by his neighbors. When Ivonis was eight years old, he strangled his sister Jennifer until she went unconscious. In his early 20s, he broke into his neighbor's home and wrote fake checks. At age 23, Ivonis committed his first known sex crime when he exposed himself and masturbated in front of a 15-year-old girl and her three-year-old sister. He admitted to police that he uh, has these uncontrollable urges to masturbate in front of young girls. And all he had to do was pay a fine, and they let him go. In 1992, Ivonitz was honorably discharged from the Navy, and he moved to Virginia from Columbia, South Carolina. In 1995, he broke into a home and raped a 13-year-old girl at gunpoint. In 1996, which, by the way, is the year that the Route 29 Stalker series began, Ivonitz abducted 16-year-old Sophia Silva from her front yard. Police eventually found Sophia's nude, decomposed body in a swamp, and they noted that her pubic area had been shaved off. In 1997, he kidnapped, raped, and murdered the Lisk sisters, Katie, 12 years old, and Kristen, 15 years old. Police later found their bodies in the Santa Ana River. Both girls had their pubic areas shaved. In 1999, Ivonitz moved back to Columbia, South Carolina, where, in 2002, he kidnapped and raped 15-year-old Kara Robinson from the front yard of her friend's home. Her friend's parents immediately called police to file a missing persons report and although Kara was known as a straight-A student who never got in trouble and never had any problems that anyone knew of, police labeled her as a runaway. Ivonitz abducted her using a ruse that he was selling magazines and stuck a gun to her neck, put her in a plastic bin in the back of his Pontiac Firebird, drove her to his apartment where he repeatedly raped her over an 18-hour period. Kara was able to gain his trust by acting nice to him and talking with him about his life and helping him clean his apartment between his assaults on her. She was able to escape after Ivanis thought he had handcuffed her to his bed and he fell into a deep sleep. She ran for help and was taken to the police who went immediately to Ivanis's apartment thanks to Kara uh, noting so many details about him and his address and his exact apartment. But Ivonitz had fled. While hiding in Jacksonville, Florida, he called his sister Jennifer, said he had murdered someone, and that he'd murdered more people than he could even remember. He asked Jennifer to meet him at an IHOP in Manatee County. Can you believe the nerve of this evil predator? He's just going to admit to his sister he murdered a bunch of girls, but hey, uh, why don't you come meet me for pancakes? Instead, Jennifer called police, who were waiting for him at the IHOP. Ivonitz fled again, 
driving over 100 miles an hour the wrong way on the highway until police finally caught up to him. And while he was pulled over with police behind him, he blew his brains out, like the coward he was. After his death, police found items belonging to the Lisk sisters and Sophia Silva in his apartment. Police suspect him of killing Jennifer Odom, a 12-year-old girl that disappeared from her bus stop in Pascal County, Florida in 1993, Sarah Cherry, who at 12 years old was abducted, sexually assaulted, and murdered in Maine in 1988 when Ivonitz was known to be working nearby, and several other young girls. Kara Robinson went on to become a police officer in South Carolina in 2010. Today, more than 20 years after her abduction, Kara Robinson is a mother of two. She is committed to fighting crime and protecting others from the violence she experienced. Now she works as a victim's advocate and social media content creator, sharing her story and helping others heal from their trauma. I definitely want to check out her social media and support her. Many people are unaware, as I was until today. Ivonitz's DNA was tested against the DNA found at the Lolly Winans Julie Williams crime scene, and it could not be eliminated as a possible killer. So it wasn't an exact match, but it couldn't be eliminated. And of course, this was 20 years ago. I certainly hope the DNA would be tested again 20 years later with better technology, but we'll get to that in a minute. So Ivonitz may have killed Julie Williams and Lolly Winans. That is certainly big information, and it puts Ivonitz right at the top of the list as a suspect in their murders. However, his DNA hasn't been matched with any other Route 29 victims that we know of. So his DNA may have been compared to other victims, but here we are, you know, over 20 years later, Richard Ivonitz has not been named as a suspect even, um, or the killer of any other of those victims. So as always, my heart and support go out to the victims and their families. So Sophia Silva, Kristen Lisk, Katie Lisk, and of course their families have my full support. Uh, it's unspeakable tragedy what those poor girls went through and what their families are still suffering with to this day, even though they do know that their killers were Richard Ivonitz and Takara Robinson as well uh, for what she went through. And what an amazing miracle that she survived. Uh, we don't often see that result in these cases and so thankful that after 20 years later, she's still thriving, dedicating her life to helping other victims. So it's completely understandable why people thought Randy Taylor was the one and only Route 29 stalker. Completely understandable why people thought Richard Ivonitz was the one and only Route 29 stalker. And now let's talk about the third primary suspect for decades in these murders. And that person's name is Daryl Rice. So, to read you a little bit from an article about Daryl Rice, they call him the original suspect, and they're talking about the specific murders within the Route 29 series of 24-year-old Julianne Williams and 26-year-old Laura Winans. So, Daryl Rice was suspected of killing these women because he had been found to have previously committed crimes within Shenandoah National Park. He was also caught on camera entering Shenandoah National Park from the Front Royal Virginia entrance the evening of May 25th. He was seen exiting the park at Rockfish Gap the next afternoon. Rice later returned to the park on the same day that the bodies of Julianne Williams and Laura Winans were discovered. This, along with his other crimes committed in the park, led investigators to name him as the prime suspect in the murders of Williams and Winans, and therefore, according to most people, he would then be the Route 29 stalker. 
The year he was accused of committing the murders of Winans and Williams, Rice was already in jail for a 1997 case in which he was arrested for attempting to kidnap Yvonne Malbasha, a female cyclist, while on Skyline Drive. Rice had yelled sexual obscenities at her, grabbed her, and tried to force her into his truck. When she managed to get away, Rice proceeded to try and run her over with his truck multiple times. All throughout the encounter, Rice continually demanded that the woman get in his truck. Unsuccessful in this abduction attempt, Rice eventually drove away. He was later found and detained by park rangers. In this case, Weiss, Rice was convicted and given a 135-month sentence. The prosecutors described Rice as being anti-gay and sexist towards women. Uh, Miss Williams and Winans were uh, reportedly a lesbian couple. And so here's where the case takes a big turn. So as certain as authorities were that Rice was the killer, he had the case dropped. And they dropped the case against him right after basically saying there was so much evidence against him, it's absurd to suggest that Richard Ivonitz was the killer or anybody else uh, because Rice was the killer. And then they dropped charges against him because new DNA results revealed that it was not his DNA at the crime scene but it was a, that of an unknown male. Love to find out who that unknown male was. And again, this is the case that Richard Ivonitz's DNA could not be eliminated from. Investigators still claim that Rice was involved in some way. However, no new evidence has come forward to support that claim. Because his DNA evidence proved that Rice was not the perpetrator, the case lost ground and remains unsolved as of 2023. So now I want to read uh, from an article by WUSA 9 and they're quoting the Virginia, the University of Virginia Innocence Project and also quoting Rice's lawyer. So a lawyer for a man once charged in the deaths of the two hikers, Miss Williams and Miss Winans, she believes DNA that would lead to the real killer of Julie and her part Julie Williams and her partner Lolly Winans in Shenandoah Park in 1996 still sits stashed away all but untested in an evidence locker at the FBI lab in Quantico Virginia but she believes that the FBI is so locked in on Rice still to this day um, this is an article from 2021 and that they, they just won't even test anybody else. Deidre Enright, who's the founder and director of the Innocent Pro Innocence Project at the University of Virginia School of Law, she was Daryl Rice's attorney, quote, they have male DNA on a gag. They have hairs. The last time it was analyzed was about 20 years ago. And at that time, the results failed to pinpoint the killer. But forensic technology has advanced dramatically since then. Investigators found the nude, bound, and gagged bodies of Julie and Lolly just off Skyline Drive near the Skyline Lodge, June 1, 1996. Their throats had been slashed. A year later, police arrested Daryl Rice for attempting to abduct another woman, the bicyclist we just spoke about. In 2004, federal prosecutors were forced to drop the murder charges against Rice after hair and DNA evidence found at the scene did not match his. There's male DNA on the gag in Julie's mouth. There are hairs under the duct tape. They weren't Daryl Rice's. But Enright said the FBI may not need new tips to solve the case. She has an alternate, an alternative suspect, Richard Ivonitz. The man police said murdered Katie and Kristen List, 12 and 15, and Sophia Silva, 16, in Spotsylvania County, the same year Julie and Lolly were killed. DNA at the crime scene in Shenandoah National Park did not exclude Ivonitz as a suspect. Prosecutors admitted so Enright says, Richard Mark Ivonitz killed people. 
He told his sister right before he killed himself, I killed more people than I can remember. That's not three. Rice's lawyer first pointed to Ivanitz as the real killer almost 20 years ago. At the time, prosecutors called the argument specious and said there was not one scintilla of evidence to support it. That was right before they dropped the charges against Rice. Tom Williams, Julie Williams' father, flatly rejects the idea that Ivanitz might be his daughter's real killer. Quote, I think it's a ruse, Tom Williams said. The FBI are not the kind of people that are going to try to pin some guilt on somebody that's not guilty. They just aren't, end quote. And by the way, as you know, I have so much sympathy for Mr. Williams and his entire family and what these victims' families go through, getting their hearts torn out, and, you know, left and right, every time there's a trial without a conviction, every time it turns out that the suspect, that they were told by the FBI, this is the guy, and look at the mountain of evidence we have against him, and then it turns out not to be him. But I don't know how Mr. Williams, and especially the FBI, can't evolve their theory, given that Daryl Rice's DNA and hairs didn't match at the scene. Um, we want the real killer for the Williams family, but I understand their frustration. I understand their heartbreak. I mean, it's just got to be so grueling to go through what they're going through 20-something years later, still just seeking justice and answers for what happened to their dearly loved daughters. But Enright has some unusual allies, Harley and Sadie Showalter, whose own daughter, Alicia Showalter, Alicia Showalter Reynolds, was murdered the same month as Julie and Lolly. In court documents, prosecutors suggested Rice might also be the Route 29 killer, suspected of abducting and trying to abduct at least 20 women driving the highway, including Alicia, by waving them down and telling them that they had sparks coming from under their cars. So Sadie Showalter said she asked FBI investigators a year ago if they looked at Richard Ivonitz. They blew, quote, they blew it off and they again said Daryl Rice. We're not finished with him yet, Sadie Showalter said. Now, can you believe that the FBI, 20 years later, after Daryl Rice's DNA did not match the victims, 20 years later, the FBI is saying to a victim's mother, ah, we're not done with Daryl Rice yet. Are you kidding me? What are you guys doing? Uh, I mean, whatever it is you're not done with, please do it. What does that mean? Retesting Rice's DNA, which, by the way, I have no problem with, given his other activities, which we haven't even finished on yet. There's still more on Rice. Um, but what are you waiting for? 20 years later, oh, we're not finished with him yet. Fine, retest his DNA already with your, you know, more advanced DNA technology, and if and when it fails to match again, because don't forget... Ivonitz couldn't be eliminated. Rice could be eliminated. So what are you still stuck on him for and saying, oh, no, it can't be Ivonitz? So, yeah, guys, 20 years later, let's go. Test Daryl Rice's DNA again. Fine. Test Richard Ivonitz's DNA again to see if the new technology can match him. So retest them. If you don't get anywhere with them, test Randy Taylor. Test Rex Yorman. Uh, let's go on these cases. So uh, the Showalters want the evidence retested again using modern DNA analysis. Enright said the answers still lie in the FBI lab. Quote from the lawyer, Miss Enright, you test the evidence and then you say I'm wrong. End quote. WUSA 9 has reached out to the FBI repeatedly for comment on this story, but has yet to receive a response. Shortly after the dismissal of those charges against Rice for Julie and Lolly's murders, uh, in June 2004, Prince William authorities charged Rice uh, in, February, in the February 1996 attacks against Carmelita B. Shomo, who was abducted and beaten while she was driving home from work 
along Route 234 near Manassas. Prosecutors tried to link the crime to a series of incidents in rural Virginia which are the so-called Route 29 stalker case where he tricked or tried to trick more than a dozen women, it's actually around 20, into pulling off the side of the road by flashing his truck lights and telling them they had sparks coming up from underneath their car and to let him take a look, he's a mechanic. It was a allegation after allegation that was about nothing, said Deidre Enright, his lawyer. So prosecutor's main witness in that case, Shomo, took the stand and could not remember that she had initially told investigators conflicting details about the attack. She even denied that she, had, that she had been charged with writing bad checks years ago in North Carolina, even though defense attorneys produced records proving otherwise. I don't know what that, any of that has to do with her being attacked. Shomo pointed to Rice in court as her attacker, but defense attorneys called to the stand a retired police detective and a private investigator who said they were with Shomo when she identified two other people as her attacker. One of the two previous suspects that the victim, Miss Shomo, had identified to police was Richard Ivonitz. Uh, prosecutors amended the most serious charge, abduction with intent to defile, to abduction, which carries a lesser sentence. During a long break in the afternoon, prosecutors offered numerous, deal, offered numerous deals to Rice that he kept turning down. So Daryl Rice ended up accepting a plea deal that would give him no additional time in prison. He was already in prison. And they said, well, this is all for the strategy my best interest is, is to return him to his family, is, is what his lawyer said. But the bottom line is, Daryl Rice pled guilty in the incident with Miss Shomo. Now, for those of you, to, to remind those of you who saw my video or who are familiar with this case, this is the incident that uh, first sparked, uh, you know, police said that whoever did this incident was the Route 29 killer who was five foot ten to six feet tall and this if you remember is one of his first quote unquote dry runs well this was actually police theorized more than a dry run this was him between his dry runs where he was practicing his routine and wasn't attempting to assault the victims they actually believe this was his first attempted assault on a victim and I believe it was like a week before Alicia Showalter Reynolds murder and this is where he picked up the woman said you got car trouble she got in his truck he said he was gonna drive her to the gas station and then he kept slowing down kinda of looking for an area to assault her and it made her so nervous they started fighting within the car and he just got tired of fighting with her and he kicked her out of the car and she broke her ankle as she fell out of the car and he sped away now, for decades, police, media, web sleuths were saying, well, whoever did that, that is the route, the one and only Route 29 stalker. And if we can just catch that person, we've, we've solved our entire uh, series of cases. Well, Daryl Rice pled guilty in that case, although the charges were reduced and he was offered multiple plea deals in one day of the trial because they said the pros the prosecutor said they were engaging the reaction from the jury and the jury wasn't buying their story that he was actually that person again especially with the inconsistencies from Miss Shomo on the witness stand and um, you know the prosecutors believe she was telling the truth uh, about the attack from uh, Rice but she was skillfully cross-examined but when you previously identified two different people as your attacker, it's going to be really hard to convince a jury, rightfully so, that the third person you said did it, actually did it, and, and that's what they're supposed to basically base their entire conviction on. But the bottom line is, and I know the lawyer's saying, well, you know, he only took the plea deal because it would have meant no additional jail time. The bottom line is, he pled guilty to that incident. And so therefore, he's the Route 29 stalker, right? Well, don't forget, his DNA and his hairs do not match Lolly Winans and Julie Williams' killer, and everybody says the Route 29, the one and only Route 29 stalker killed them. So this case is much more complicated 
than I think any of us really knew, or at least most of us. There could have been multiple killers in that series. It may not have been all one person. This is also a huge reason why I still to this day highly suspect Rex Hurman was guilty of at least some of those murders. I think, as do most other people who've seen the comparison, that the composite sketch of the Route 29 stalker looks just like Rex Hurman. My biggest takeaway from the Route 29 stalker series of murders is there is highly likely to be more than one killer. Randy Taylor, by definition, was a Route 29 stalker. This applies to all of them, but are we really supposed to believe that Randy Taylor just happened to bump into this pretty young girl, decides to kidnap her, rape her, murder her, uh, bury her somewhere, but oh no, that was his very first time ever doing that. And then three years earlier, he's a likely suspect in Samantha Clark's murder. So this guy never murdered anybody and just all of a sudden decides to do two murders within three years and that was it for, for Randy. Daryl Rice who pled guilty to being the guy who pushed the woman out of the car, broke her ankle after luring her into his truck uh, with the ruse of, oh, you've got car trouble. That person was supposed to be the one and only Route 29 killer, except for he's not. But even with that said, am I supposed to believe what he did to the cyclist in Shenandoah Park and what he did to Miss Shomo, desperately trying to get her into his truck, pushing her out of the truck and breaking his ankle, breaking her ankle. I'm supposed to believe that was his first two and only times ever doing something like that before? And if you just want to go with the theory that, well, Rex Sherman has currently only been charged with four murders, let's ignore the other seven victims that are nearby, including one who a witness now claims she last saw alive, running naked in fear from Rex Sherman, and that victim is found right near the four victims he is charged with murdering. Okay, let's just go with the four he's charged with. They were killed in just a three-year span from 2007 to 2010. So again, you've got a guy who lived for into his 40s, when most serial killers start in their 20s or early 30s, but this one, allegedly, waited until his 40s and then just decided out of nowhere, oh, I'm just going to kill four girls, very cold, very calculating. I'm going to strangle them with basically my bare hands. I'm going to wrap them up nice and neat like a little package. I'm going to dump them, you know, in a nearby beach right in a row. And that allegedly is the first time that he ever did anything like that. And then, just as quickly as he started, he decided to stop altogether and just never harm a fly again. And in order to believe that theory, you then also have to believe that a separate serial killer who knew nothing about Rex Uriman and nothing about him dumping bodies there also decided to dump bodies there. I think that is highly unlikely. What do we know about serial killers? Do they start in their 40s and then stop three years later never to kill again? For 13 years. I have been following this case and I have always felt, long before I had heard of anyone named Rex Sherman, long before his arrest, I felt whoever the Gilgo Beach serial killer was must have killed other places. It, the timeline just doesn't make sense. I believe he's responsible for all the victims there. I didn't know about a witness who was going to tie him to Karen Vergata, which really is the key murder, if you think about it, because that is the first known victim at Gilgo. So if he's responsible for her and he's responsible for the four killed between 2000 and 2010, I mean, what are we cherry picking here? Yet he's not responsible for Peaches and her baby one year after Karen Vergata and Peaches was killed almost in identical fashion and disposed of, I should say. In, a, in basically identical fashion to Karen Vergata, as were the next two known victims, Valerie Mack and Jessica Taylor. I mean, it just fits that it's Herman.
for all of them, or at least most of them, I guess we could say. Um, and if you've got somebody capable of that kind of savagery over that many decades with that many huge gaps of time in between, are we really supposed to believe he never killed anywhere else? So that is why I want people to take a serious look at places like Virginia and other places as well in South Carolina where Julia Bean's daughter says the last person my mom was ever seen alive with was Rex Herman. I think that should be taken seriously. Doesn't prove that it's true, but when you've interacted with somebody to that extent, like Julia Bean's daughter claims she did, Herman is so unique physically. There's not a ton of people who look just like him. He doesn't have that, oh, everyday guy next door look. You know, not a ton of guys are as tall and big and ogre-ish looking and everybody who meets him describes him as this big, weird, Frankenstein looking dude who acts awkward and, and strange to creepy, stalkerish. And, you know, down in South Carolina, a guy who looks like that drives the truck that he drives, has a Long Island accent, I think that guy's going to stick out. And I believe her story, that it was Herman. Anyways, getting back to Virginia, the major potential break in this case happened this week. I don't know if you guys saw it. I know the symposium with John Ray was really hard to hear. And I did my best to put out the video and explain what each person was saying and the closed captioning hopefully helped. But there was a woman who did not attend the symposium, but John Ray read her sworn affidavit where she claims that in 1997, just one year after the Route 29 stalker murders happened to start in Virginia, she claims she was jogging in a park and was repeatedly stalked and followed by Rex Sherman, who would creep up behind her, you know, without her even noticing, asking her all these weird questions. Then he'd disappear into the woods again, pop out in another part of the woods, stalking her more. It freaked her out so much that she ran from the park, didn't even take her own bike home, called her sister to have her come get picked up, and even reported it to police. It was such a serious situation to her. And again, it's not proof that her story is accurate. It's not proof that it was Rex Hurman, although the physical description is uncanny, even down to him wearing the camouflage jacket, which we've heard from several other witnesses. Also interesting, the video, we watched earlier in the Cheryl Warner murder, that person was wearing a camouflage jacket. And I know lots of people wear camouflage. It's not like only one guy wears it, but yet it is one more piece that fits. I'm doubting that that's Herman in that Cheryl Warner video, but I'm not 100% sure. If her story is true, this jogger named Nancy, then that puts Herman in Virginia, not just in Virginia. I mean, he's playing around in the woods. I mean, that's very comfortable with that area. That's a person who, that's not their first time there. You know, you, you didn't just, that's not your first day stepping foot in Virginia. He says his mom sold him the house and moved to Virginia in 1994. He says he drove down to visit her regularly for decades. That puts him in Virginia. The landscaper from 2018 who said Herman stiffed him on the work he did for his mother, who was getting ready to move at that point. He had to sue Herman to get the measly 800 bucks or whatever it was. He's in Virginia, guys, you know? And so again, is a guy like that gonna be in Virginia for decades? And no, but I won't harm anybody here where nobody knows me. There's woods and water everywhere in Virginia, very rural, especially the places he was frequenting. The highway that he drives back and forth to New York goes through all kinds of small towns like Lignum, or at least nearby, like Culpeper, which isn't a small town, but I mean, he is driving back and forth, back and forth for decades through 
all these areas where these women are being brutally murdered. And as I said earlier, I don't believe there is one Route 29 stalker, one and only, but I believe Herman is one of them. I believe that person. Thirteen years of following this case, I felt that whoever was the Gilgo Beach serial killer had killed other places. And oh, what do you know, he looks very similar to two composite sketches in that series of murders. And a witness has now identified him as trying to at least abduct her or harm her in some way in some woods. What do you think would have happened to her? if he had gotten his hands on her and dragged her back into those woods. So, I think that's a huge potential break in this case. You know, because before this witness came forward, and we only heard her affidavit this week, before this, it was just speculation. Oh, you know, Murder Rink and Nathan Adams, and they're just speculating, speculating. Well, we're not speculating anymore. I'm not the one who claims he tried to abduct and potentially kill or seriously harm a woman in the woods in Virginia. That's the woman making that allegation. And it fits with what we know. So again, does it prove it 100%? No. She, thankfully, is still alive to tell her story. How many other poor, young, female, attractive women are out there who we're not fortunate enough to survive this alleged monster, this cowardly, evil killer. They can't tell their story. So it's our job to seek the truth. And I just want to thank all you guys for being on this journey with me. This isn't the only case we're going to look at. I am obsessed with lots of serial killers. <laughs> I mean, you know, as you can see, as you will see from my channel, this is an interest of mine since I was a kid. I've been a web sleuth for years before there was even a such thing as a web. I will continue doing this stuff. If you guys want me to keep making videos about it, I will. I enjoy it. And again, I do it in pursuit of the truth, in pursuit of justice. I'll never accept this kind of evil, random, selective killing. This could have been my sister. This could have been my friend, my mother, my whoever. You know, and I don't even have to know the person to care about them. It's humanity. What kind of world do we want? What kind of country do we want? Do we want to feel safe, relatively safe, when we walk out our door? Do we have to keep an eye on our daughters, our sisters, our girlfriends, like every single second of the day. So I will never accept people like this. I don't respect them. I consider them cowards. I consider them evil and pathetic. The damage that they've done to so many human beings, the amount of families they've ruined, heartbroken parents, heartbroken siblings, heartbroken loved ones for life. And then if you want to agree with me that he likely killed all the victims at Gilgo, uh, at least all the ones who've been found so far, then you got to go back to 1996. That's Karen Vergata. The exact same year the Route 29 stalker murder started in Virginia. But just even look at the Karen Vergata murder. Uh, that's a killer's very first uh, dipping of the toe into murdering. Guy's lived his whole life, he's in his early 30s, and oh yeah, I think I'm just gonna start murdering now. And that's your first murder. A girl who multiple witnesses saw you with as the last person she's seen with alive. But even though multiple witnesses saw you with her, you feel comfortable killing her, chopping her body up, spreading her body parts around. Maybe you did that uh, because you knew you were seen with her and you you wanted to make it very difficult to identify her. That's your very first murder ever. And then the very next year, I guess in your second ever murder, uh, you kill a woman and her two-year-old baby, and you chop the woman up, and you put part of her at Gilgo, the rest of her you put at Hempstead State Lake Park, which is a huge park. You could have put her in the water. You could have put her deep in the woods. But nope, you put her in a Rubbermaid tub and put her right on a walking path where you know 
she will be found. That's your, that's your second murder ever. Okay. Same with Richard Ivanitz. Are these the only murders that he ever committed? The ones that we talked about, the two Lisk sisters and Sophia Silva. He would have killed Kara Robinson. And he told his own sister, I have killed more people than I, more women, girls, whatever, than I can even remember. This theory that it's just one stalker who killed all those people, uh, I just think is much less likely than more than one killer. And we, at this point, we already know for a fact that there is more than one Route 29 killer, especially over a course of years. So Herman, he is a known serial killer who is driving back and forth, back and forth on Route 29 and in other areas of Virginia for decades. And there's other known serial killers in that area. So police, media, web sleuths need to evolve our theories. I agree with Miss Enright of the UVA Innocence Project when she says, you test the DNA, then tell me I am wrong. I don't care about being wrong. I don't care what this killer or killer's name or identity actually is. I only care that they get caught and brought to justice. New, New York law says you can't enter a suspect's DNA into national database CODIS until a conviction. You can, however, petition a judge for a specific case now, like Las Vegas police did in the Victoria Camara case. But once it's uploaded into CODIS, I believe there will be many matches in many states, including Virginia and all over New York, up, uh, Long Island, New York City, and upstate New York as well. So pressure needs to be put on Virginia FBI as they are still clinging to Daryl Rice as a suspect in charges that they themselves dismissed 20 years ago. Pressure needs to also be put on Virginia state and local police who can also test DNA. So, test the DNA of Daryl Rice, Richard Ivonitz, Randy Taylor, Rex Herman, and then tell us they're not the killers, and tell us who is. It makes no difference who the real killer or killers are. We just need to find them and bring them to justice for the sake of the victims and their families who deserve justice and answers, and for society who deserves protection from and punishment of these vicious, evil, cowardly killers. Test the DNA, tell us we're wrong, tell us we're right. We'll follow the evidence wherever it takes us. As always, my heart goes out to the victims and their families. We've talked about a lot of them in this video. Uh, the Williams family, the Winans family, the Showalter family, the Lisk family, the Silva family, the Murphy family, the Clark family, the Vergata family, Peach's family, the Howard family, Megan Waterman's family, Amber Costello's family, Melissa Bartholomew's family, Maureen Brainerd Barnes family, Jessica Taylor's family, oh, all the victims at Gilgo Beach, Va Valerie Max family, all the victims, Shannon Gilbert's family, the unidentified Asian males family. Okay guys, so that is my update and my reposting of Is Rex Sherman the Route 29 Stalker video. You know, my reporting has evolved just in the couple of months I've been reporting on this story. Again, I was one of the first people to break it on Twitter in, I think my first report on Twitter was from September about the connection between Herman to Virginia. Basically, as soon as I found out his mom had moved there and lived there for decades, I was like, oh my God, I got to start looking into Virginia because I guarantee you he has victims there and nothing's proven yet. And it's, you know, again, he's hasn't been charged with anything in Virginia, but I'll be very surprised if charges won't be coming, especially once his DNA is entered into national database CODIS. I think CODIS is going to do uh, a huge service for law enforcement and for these victims. 
and it is going to jumpstart murder investigations in many states and many different parts of New York. That's my prediction. If I'm wrong, I'll make a video saying I'm wrong. Multiple videos. If I am this far off on this guy, and it turns out, oh, nope, he only killed the four, that's it. All The other seven were someone else, and he never, his DNA never showed up on a single victim off of Gilgo Beach. I, it'll be stunning to me, but I'll talk about that because that'll be interesting too. But uh, anybody who wants to bet me, I would say save your money because <laughs> this is one bet I don't think I'm going to lose. But we'll see. We'll see how it all plays out. Any suspect I mentioned in my video who has not already been found guilty in a court of law is presumed innocent. And as always, in my videos, my heart and support goes out to the victims and their families. Somebody killed those women and men and baby. Might have been more than one killer. Only time will tell. But they are my focus. They are what matters most to me and their families and getting answers and justice for them and finding this killer or killers, everyone who may have been responsible and holding them accountable. Thank you guys so much, like I said, for, you know, caring about these victims too. I love talking to you guys. I love seeing you guys talk to each other. We got to do a live event soon, but let's just keep at it. You know, you guys really help fuel me and um, I've got so many more videos coming deep dive videos, shorter videos. Um, it just, they never stop because, you know, these cases never stop. These cases that capture our imagination. I also like looking back at old cases that I wasn't that familiar with and doing a deep dive because I end up learning a ton just from my reporting. When I did the video about the West Mesa serial killer, the bone collector, I was familiar with that story somewhat. I saw the 2010 Dateline NBC story about it, but I learned a ton just from my own research on that video. So anyways, guys, thank you so much for the support of my channel. I really appreciate it. As always, my heart and sympathy goes out to the victims in this case and in all the cases I report on. And feel free, as always, to like, share, subscribe, comment. It means a lot. Hope everybody's doing well. Talk with you soon.